Hello, there we are. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Christy Miller Saunders, our seminar speaker for the day. I've worked closely with Christy for the past several years, uh, and it's really a privilege to introduce such a great person uh, and host a great person to a place uh, that we actually have both grown to love over the years. Uh, Christy comes to us all the way from British Columbia, Canada, where she's the head of molecular genomics at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which is the Canadian federal government's uh, fisheries department. And Christy has BML roots. Uh, she did her bachelor's here at UC Davis and did various courses here at BML in the late 80s when Cadet Hand was the, uh, was the director here. Um, she told me a story this morning uh, of taking directed studies uh, courses here while also taking courses at main campus, which actually meant just stealing notes from her friends and not going to the course ever and then showing up on the day of the exam uh, and uh, winging it much to the surprise of her professors. And that didn't surprise me because uh, up in Canada, most of me and my colleagues, all that we had heard about what California scientists did was sunbathing on fishing docks, which is not has not been my experience <laughs> since moving here. Um, after her time at UC Davis, uh, Christy did her master's at University of British Columbia and her PhD at Stanford, where she again uh, spent some time here and in housing at BML, studying invertebrate recruitment dynamics. And now as a government scientist, she runs a massive multifaceted research program uh, that uses genomic approaches to study the holistic health of salmon and the ecosystems they depend on. So with that, let's all welcome Christy back to BML. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Down. I have a really loud voice anyway. I hardly ever need a microphone. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Sean. And I'm excited to be back here. I wasn't. I was last time I was here was in the mid 1990s when there was a salmon. Uh, genetics meeting. Um, so yeah, it's changed a bit. The buildings are more connected and it looks bigger to me. Um, yeah, so uh, before I talk, I, don't, I never want to forget to um, acknowledge all the people because I, I have a big program and tons of people involved in the research that we do. Um, uh, a, a really great technical team that has been with me for some of them for 30 years. I've been with Fisheries for 32 years. Um, a number of biologists that uh, analyze data, run my lab, um, uh, deal with databases and do challenge studies. Uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation is a huge partner in my lab and we've been working together since 2013, mostly on the Strategic Salmon Health pro Project, which I'll talk about. Um, I, this is just a few of the postdocs that are most intimately involved in the data I'm producing today, but there's many others that have been involved in my program. Many other academics, but I only picked the one, the one that was closest to what I'm presenting today. So um, when I was here in California back in the mid 80s, actually, 1983 and 84, um, salmon was already crashing. Um, and I got a job with California Fish and Game in 1984, just when I graduated um, my undergraduate degree, um, doing the head tag program. And I would go out to the fishing docks and look for salmon coming in, and there was hardly any as the crash already happened. And I shared a house with a, a fisherman at the time at Goat Rock, which is a really cool place. Um, I had no idea that I would ultimately end up working in it. But when I joined Fisheries and Oceans in Canada um, in, the, in the early 90s, um, the crashes were already um, there. And it was multi-species, multi-stocks um, up and down um, the, obviously, California, Oregon, Washington, and into British Columbia. Now it's into Alaska. So these salmon declines are, are, are a huge issue. BC is very, very salmon-based. Um, community. Um, one thing that was really interesting in these salmon declines, though, was that um, in addition to the, the loss of, of um, productivity in salmon, there was increased regional coherence in population productivity. When that, what that means is that stocks in close proximity to each other, maybe not in the same watershed, but coming out into the ocean around the same time, had very similar different recruitment, di recruitment dynamics. So pre-1990, there really weren't that many regional similarities in how many fish would return between these uh, regional localized stocks. But post-1990, there was. And what that told the scientists was that 
that what's going on um, contributing to these salmon declines wasn't simply what's in the freshwater environment, which has always been what we typically study because it's much easier to study, but it was something to do with the marine environment, especially the early marine environment, the calming, rearing habitats that, that salmon have when they first enter the ocean. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, centers on that early marine rearing period. So, um, you know, one, once it was kind of felt that, that we needed to do more on the early marine um, uh, rearing and survival, there's been all kinds of different studies that have gone on to try to understand early marine survival in salmon. Uh, they range from looking at predation, harbor seals is a big one, um, prey abundance is, is probably the, the most studied area, sea surface temperature anomalies, uh, and growth, and looking for factors that they can use in models to predict how many fish would come back in different years. What they weren't really doing when I started in this field, and I, I kind of moved from um, genetics into more genomics and, and health, was um, salmon health. And, and, I, and I, when I say salmon health, I mean it sort of holistically in terms of both their infectious health, um, the um, role of pathogens, their, um, their stressors um, that, they, that they experience in the environment, which obviously are increasing with climate change, and sort of their nutritional health and, and immunity and whether they are experiencing wounding. Um, and so holistically, these together make up what, whether a fish is healthy or, or not healthy. Um, and so I began in about, um, about nine, uh, no, not 1900, <laughs> uh, about two, two, 2010, um, trying to devise a program to how do we study salmon health in a wild context in the ocean. And most of my program is very field-based. I do some work in a lab, but, but I'm really interested in seeing salmon and, and studying salmon in their natural environments. So you have all these environmental stressors and pathogens, and I've spent many years developing tools to actually understand the effects of pathogens and environmental stressors, and I'm gonna talk about those today. More recently in my program, I'm also interested in ecosystem health. And ecosystem health can be, you know, the, the prey, the predators, the competitors, harmful algae, and other things. I study that now using environmental DNA. So if you put these two together, you can look at the health of the fish themselves and the health of the, of the ecosystems that they live in and identify if there are areas along the coast where salmon are, are thriving um, and doing really well and what are the ecosystem indicators in those areas and then contrast them to areas where salmon are doing poorly. So there's three kind of molecular toolkits that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and the first is high throughput quantitative PCR to screen um, for dozens of salmon pathogens. I do this with a microfluidics platform. This had never done be been done before when I started this in salmon um, in about 2013. Salmon fit chips, I'll then talk about salmon fit chips, and these are basically uh, curated biomarker panels that identify when and where salmon are feeling different kinds of stress, and I can um, talk a little bit about that. Um, and the, the, the cool thing about the fit chips is that they can be used non-lethally because they use a very small gill biopsy sample. I'm very much into minimizing um, um, lethal sampling. Um, and then environmental DNA, and that can tell us about the health of the salmon ecosystem. So I'll be like three different pillars of what I'll talk about. First, I'll start with salmon pathogens. So um, I testified at, at a Cohen Commission of Inquiry, which is when there was um, uh, an inquiry into the declines in Fraser River sockeye salmon. Sockeye salmon from the Fraser River was the most economically important group of stocks of salmon in, in British Columbia. And, and, and I testified in the disease hearings, and what became really abundantly clear is that nobody really knew what role disease might be playing in the environment. It's really, we, it, there just weren't the tools to study it. So I love uh, difficult questions, so I went, well, maybe there are some tools, maybe we can develop something. So the question really was, is disease an important factor in marine mortality of juvenile salmon? I worked with Dr. Brian Riddle, who is from the Pacific Salmon uh, Foundation, and they, they've been strong uh, partners of mine uh, to this date. We developed something called a Strategic Salmon Health Initiative, which was highly supported by uh, an agency called Genome British Columbia. And it primarily focused on the early marine survival, um, and we were interested ultimately in the synergistic relationships between stress and disease, but we started by just developing technologies to, to focus on the pathogens themselves. Um, and, and really we were also, because I was funded through Genome BC, we were constantly trying to find genomic technologies, develop and find genomic technologies that could help us in understanding these um, diseases. And then also um, the interactions between cultured fish and wild fish. 
So this is just a few of the things that we did within the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative. We developed the high throughput pathogen monitoring, which is, uh, I have another slide on that, but what she's shown, this is what the output looks like. Um, molecular monitoring for stress and disease, which is I'm going to talk about. Um, high throughput sequencing for viral uh, discovery, which was done actually in Dr. Curtis Suttles' lab, who is here with me today. Um, and we developed tools to visualize pathogens and localize them in tissues and, and understand uh, the combination between pathology and, and the localization of, of infective agents. But the big thing that we did that was really very different was we collected so much data over so many pathogens um, over so many years in multiple species that we could actually do epidemiological modeling over a decade of early marine um, growth for three different species. Okay, yeah, I can hold it, how about that? Here, um, and, and we were actually able to look at, uh, to develop models to look at population level impacts of pathogens, to identify from dozens of different pathogens that we'd been monitoring, which ones actually co-varied with annual variants and survival across multiple different stocks and species. Uh, with that at work, we could also uh, look for hotspots of infection. We could look at ecological drivers for, for pathogens and infection. And we could begin to look at transmission pathways. I'm only really going to talk about the first one of those for today. So this is a picture of a, of a fluid, fluidine biomark microfluidics um, dynamic array. I'm not going to get too much into technical details here. But this is the workhorse of my lab, I can tell you. So. Um, Basically, it, it, it holds um, samples, samples of fish, 96 samples at a time, um, and samples of assays, 96 different assays at a time. And it does 9,216 different independent qPCR tests um, it, across one um, chip. And we can run multiple chips at a day. You can generate so much data with these. It's incredible. And this is just what a fluidine biomark looks like. Um, and this is, this is the output. So you have basically your samples are shown here. This is a, just a heat map of what, of what is detected in your samples. This is uh, duplicates of different pathogen assays in fish. And those are individual fish over on the side. And where you see the bright colors, you see detections, and you could actually quantitate those detections. It's just typical qPCR, but in a much bigger scale. So in, in the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative, we looked at 47, initially we looked at 47 different um, infective agents that are known to infect salmon. Um, and we, I didn't just focus on what we knew about North America. I went all over the world, took every pathogen that we could find in aquaculture or any other system um, and added and, and developed assays and added it to the panel to see what was actually in British Columbia because no one had ever done those kind of surveys before. And then we, we started a huge collection program where we collected fish along the, along the British Columbia coast. I, I live over here on Vancouver Island, but we had surveys um, through DFO that went in the spring, summer, and fall, and occasionally over winter um, to collect fish. And so we had a, a really huge range of fish that we could be working with, and Chinook coho sockeye mostly. And so the only result I'm going to show you from this was like the final big result that we, we were working towards, which was the modeling. So we employed stock recruitment models, the same kind of models that are used to look at any factors that are associated with survival in salmon um, and productivity. Um, we employed the same kind of approach on pathogens. So we had, um, we had 47 different pathogens to work with, um, and, and we had to whittle down to the ones that we had enough data for. So for each species, that was usually 20 to 25 that we detected in enough fish to actually model. And, and then we, we basically applied these stock recruitment models looking at at co-variation with survival across multiple different stock complexes. Um, the data I'm showing you here, we looked at survivorship models for Chinook over here, sampled in the spring and summer and in the fall and winter, and coho salmon in the spring and summer and the fall and winter. We also collect or made models to look at body condition, so the relationship between uh, the amount of the pathogens within, within a fish and the body condition of the fish, which was relative weight. Um, so fish that that had a low body condition or very low relative weight um, um, and a high level of, of, of specific pathogens. And so these little numbers here, the higher the number, the closer it is to one, uh, the more negative effect it has on survival. Um, if it's blue, it has a positive effect or no effect at all. And this is kind of the scale bar here. And so what we did was we sorted these. To where, what we're looking for is looking at two different species that are fairly similar life histories 
and, and over, over the early marine period, over about a similar period of time. And we were looking for pathogens that showed a negative impact on both survival and body condition in both species. So consistent ones, because we're trying to whittle down 47 agents to a small number of agents that we need to do further study in. And if you look at this, the top two that come, that come in um, onto the top here are Tenacibacula maritimum, which is a, uh, a marine uh, bacterium that causes an ulcerative disease, and I'll talk about that in a second, and Piscina ortho-reovirus, which was really recently discovered um, in dying fish on, from Atlantic salmon farms in Norway. Um, it was discovered in the early 2000s, and, but the virus wasn't discovered till 2010. We discovered it in British Columbia in 2012. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit on these. Um, another way to look at these model results is to, is, is to this is just looking at Chinook salmon, looking at the coefficient for mass deviation on the, on the y-axis and the coefficient for survival, and you see three agents that are low on both, that are negatively associated with both of those. This is Piscine ortho-reovirus. This is Tenacibacula maritimum. That's Loma salmonae, which is a parasite. The model predicts for, for Piscine ortho-reovirus that a 10% increase in this virus is associated with a 23% decrease in survival. And for um, Tenacibacula baculum, it was a 10% increase was associated with a 12% decrease in survival. So these actually had a pretty um, per, uh, pretty strong effect in Chinook salmon. And so Piscine ortho reovirus um, was originally, as I said, found in Atlantic salmon farms in Norway, associated with a disease called heart and skeletal muscle inflammation. When I, I started put adding it to the panel with lots of other things, I was actually doing a little bit of work with, uh, with a Chinook aquaculture company that had fish that were turning yellow. And they were trying to figure out what the heck was going on in these fish. Was that an environmental problem? Was it, was it toxicology? Could it be a virus? Um, and we studied it and I ran microarrays on it and looked at the look at gene, gene expression. Um, and everything that we looked at, the epidemiology, the microarrays, et cetera, all pointed to a virus. And so I, I took all the viruses that I found all over the world, I ran them on the fluidine platform, I was just starting developing the technology and bang, PRV came shining out uh, very, very brightly in these fish. Uh, PRV infects red blood cells, and this is just showing uh, necrotic kidney cells from, from, from one of these Chinook salmon in a farm, uh, is surrounded by this virus, and this virus is, is all stained here with in situ in red. Um, and so that's another way before you do a challenge study to be able to show that the virus is intimately associated with the tissue that that is undergoing damage. We've done a lot of research on this and I'm not really going to say a lot more about it, but um, the other thing that we found when we looked at at the wild salmon that we had sampled over a decade, uh, the probability of infection with PRV was the highest within 30 kilometers of an active salmon farm. Um, and so this was one that could be an anthropogenic um, uh, controlled uh, agent, which was the important part. Tenacibacula maritimum, um, and this is what this is what a, a, a Pacific salmon with tenacibaculosis looks like. They don't look very pretty. It's a very visual disease. This is a juvenile salmon, um, and um, there have been studies all over the world on um, tenacibaculum. It, it, it can infect marine fish. It, it basically affects every um, marine cultured um, trout and salmon as well. Um, and it manifests a little bit different to different species, but basically it's an ulcerative disease in everybody. Uh, we also found that this one in sockeye salmon uh, peaked in detections in the, uh, right around the Discovery Island farms, which is an area of high density farming that doesn't exist anymore, um, partly because of this work. But, um, but um, this, is, this was the point in the migration for sockeye salmon where we began to detect high levels of, of, of PRV in the fish. Um, so another one that could be controlled by, by human activity. Uh, we did, recently we've done a, a farm project with the Broughton First Nations, um, looking at um, farm spillover effects. So with the environmental DNA work that we do, we actually got access to the farms because they have regulatory capacity within, within um, the indigenous communities to make decisions about whether they allow farms or not. And so they wanted to monitor the pathogens and diseases within the farmed Atlantic salmon populations. And, and for the research component of it, um, I told them that we should be monitoring the spillover effects into the water column. 
um, because it is the water, it is the pathogens in the water column that we are that are the risk to wild salmon. Um, so we 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 addressed this over about a year and a half over about ten um, active farms and several fallowed farms, um, and it it provided um, a validation of of the eDNA being a, a a really effective tool for biosecurity monitoring. This is busy, and I'm not going to go into all huge detail. These are the model results, similar kind of model as I showed you. It's not stock recruitment data, but everything to the to Okay, so we're looking at it to your right. Everything that has a square around it is a significant, neg uh, significantly associated uh, with active salmon farms. So those those um, different species. So for example, Atlantic salmon, not surprisingly, Samuel salar, is highly associated with an active farm compared to an, uh, an inactive farm. There's the control. Um, but we looked at all the different um, wild salmon species um, that, that are in that area. And only one of the wild salmon species was significantly associated with active farms. So it was more highly present in areas where active farms than where fallow farms were. Um, so probably attracted to farm sites, maybe from food, maybe because herring was also attracted. Here's herring. Herring also like to be around active farm sites. Uh, this is anchovy, but this turned out to be coming from salmon pellets. Um, so that came from the feed. Uh, if we looked at pathogens, the top one on the list is Tenacibaculum maritimum. So the spillover effects from farms are huge for Tenacibaculum. Cutthroat trout virus, um, that was one that we discovered in our viral discovery research, uh, was also highly associated. It's very common on farms. Another Tenacibaculum species, Finn Markens, which can also cause disease, was also found to be associated. And, and on and on. Here's PRV right here. So again, PRV came out in this study as, as well. So another way, I, I guess this, this slide is just to show that there are several pathogens that are important to wild salmon from our models um, that are associated with um, temperature. And Tenacibaculum maritimum is very positively associated with warmer water um, and a plethora of other ones. So I'm just quickly going through this. You don't need to look at all of them. But this is my inroads to the next slide, which is environmental stress. So looking at temperature effects, looking at salinity effects, looking at oxygen effects and, and others. So climate change, we all know <laughs> California has had worse effects of climate change than, than, than British Columbia, um, but, but all of them um, very much affected. So there are direct effects of climate change and there are indirect effects. A lot of what tends to be studied are, you know, timing and abundance of prey, which, which can, and, and nutritional quality of prey, which can be affected by temperature, um, predator distributions, um, frequency of harmful algal blooms, all of those are indirect effects. Um, who are pertaining to salmon. Um, and then there's the direct effects of, of temperature and salinity and oxygen and PCO2. It's the direct effects that I was um, developing tools to study, um, but, but the framework that I was developing was also, going, was also developed to, to be able to look at indirect effects as well. So a lot of times we're measuring the temperature of the water or measuring the oxygen of the water and people develop, oceanographers develop models to look at variation in temperature and salmon returns. And this has been done for many years. But how do we actually know when salmon are feeling the direct stress of changes in temperature, salinity, or oxygen? Um, because they, in the ocean, they can, they can go to different depths in the ocean. So are they actually feeling when there's high sea surface temperature? Are they actually feeling the effects of that hot water at the surface? So um, I spent 15 years of my, of my research time trying to develop the, um, this tool called, that we call salmon fit chips. And, and the basic premise was uh, we were looking for genes, um, panels that were co-activated in gill tissue. Everything was based on a non-lethal gill tissue um, under very specific stressor scenarios. And those, those gene panels, we needed to build classifiers, and they do, had to be highly sensitive and highly specific to that stressor and not to other stressors. Um, we, in order to do this effectively, um, we needed to be able to, dis to distinguish individual stressors, even when there's a complex multi-stressor background. So we always did challenge studies where we had lots of dis different stressors and different combination stressors going on just to do the discovery work for individual stressors. Uh, the panels had to work across habitats and species. They had to, um, um, had a potential for use of, of non-lethal um, gill biopsy samples, which we oftentimes use in conjunction with telemetry or with sterile listed species. And there had to be, um, we, we also um, tried to leave enough room on these fit chips, which is the same technology we we're using for pathogens, so it's still the dynamic array, the fluidine, um, but we had to leave enough room to also include really important pathogens and parasites and harmful algal bloom species, if that's uh, what we were studying. 
So this is all the different things that we've developed the um, panels for to date, but we're, we're now doing some more. Um, salinity stress, thermal stress, low, low oxygen stress or hypoxia. We developed, it's not a stressor, but it's really important, smolt readiness. We have hatcheries that produce tons and tons, millions and millions of fish, and they, they don't actually have a means to universally test for smolt readiness, and they all use different methods. And so we developed a panel that would be able to distinguish a pre-smolt, from a smolt to a desmolt. So the, those are pre-smolt is a fish that's adapted to fresh water, a smolt is a fish that's adapted to salt water, and a desmolt is a fish that doesn't hit salt water within about one month of a smolt window and reverts to a freshwater fish, but it's a very stressed fish. Uh, we developed a panel for viral disease to, to distinguish not just that the fish carry the virus, but that a fish is actually feeling the effects, the negative effects of a, a viral disease. Uh, that works for all RNA viruses. And then we developed a panel that actually recognizes fish that are beginning to die. Um, and this, is, this, this predicts death about 72 hours out. It's most predictive at, at the 24 to 48 hours, um, but it's, it's one of the most effective panels that we have. So in order to develop all of these, we conducted these multi-stressor challenge studies. We've conducted 10 different challenge studies to date. We've done them across multiple species. Uh, we started with Chinook, Coho, Sockeye, Chun, and Pink Salmon. We're now going into Atlantic Salmon and Arctic Char um, and Cutthroat Trout and, um, and, and other species. So in each of these studies, um, we manipulated the, the salinity, usually freshwater, brackish water, salt water. We did three different temperatures. We did the same ones every time, 10 degrees, 14 degrees, 18 degrees. Uh, we manipulated oxygen uh, to get hypoxia stress. We conducted the challenges over different smolt stages. So we took, we took pre-smolts and we challenged them to all of these conditions. We took full smolts and in, 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 and, we, and in some of the species, we did desmolts as well. And then for most of the species, we also did stressor recovery because it's just as important to understand. So these studies were taking place over six days. So they were, they were given those stresses for six days. We were not, we were not looking, we were looking for chronic stress, not acute stress. Um, and, and then we put them back into normal conditions. So if they were an 18 degree fish, they got moved back slowly into, into 10 degrees. If they were a hypoxia fish, they got moved into normoxia conditions. Um, and we looked at, at how long it took for them to recover from those signatures. So there's a lot that can be learned in challenge studies. And so we, we also look, use those challenge studies to look at synergistic um, interactions between stressors, which is really important. I'm really interested in this, in this in the field, but it's nice to be able to ground truth this in a lab. So what we found was that fish that were osmotically adapted, so full smolts, um, we're highly resilient to six days of thermal and hypoxia stress. In fact, we really got no mortality over six days in fish that were full smolts in any of the salinity environments. However, in osmotically stressed Chinook and Coho in saltwater, uh, salmon experienced both, experiencing both thermal and hypoxia stress died at five times the rate of fish with only hypoxia or thermal stress. So there was a synergistic response with multiple stressors. Desmolts were the worst. Desmolts are fish that were reverting back to fresh water. They died even if they were in fresh water. So these were very unstable fish in, in terms of um, osmoregulatory capacity. The only thing they really survived well in was brackish water. Um, you add any additional stress to desmolts and you have high mortality. So this tells us in the field if hatcheries are releasing fish that aren't actually ready to go in the marine environment, if they're not actually carefully timing them, that they could actually end up with, with low survival, low, low post-release survival. And right now in British Columbia, there is, there, there is a feeling by hatcheries that the bigger fish, the better. Like hold on to them longer and get bigger fish and release them as bigger fish. However, if you're not careful and you, in, in, about hitting the desmolt window, those are dead fish swimming. They're not going to release, release survivors. So it's really important that they have a tool to be able to distinguish the different smolt stages. So in, in, in the end result of what we got from the challenge studies really was the development of classifiers. So we had control fish with which we could develop classifiers to all of those different stressor panels. And, and what we found was that there's, there's actually an optimal number of genes to, to develop a classifier. You're looking for genes that are co-expressed under different stressor scenarios. And, and most genes can be active in many different physiological processes, but, but it turns out that that, that 
that there are specific panels of genes that are only co-expressed under certain scenarios. And so even, even if two genes on your panel is also, are also involved in another stress signature, if they're not co-expressed with the other genes, then, then that signature is not activated. Um, and so we use random forest classifiers. They're really, they really, they give you a probability that the stress is present. And then you can look at different probability thresholds and identify what threshold gives you the optimal sensitivity, which is ability to detect the presence of the stressor when it is there, um, and minimize your, your false positive rate or the specificity. You wanna optimize specificity for that stressor and no other stressor. And again, we have the background of all those different stressor scenarios to test this with. Um, we had a different data set to train the classifier and a different data set to test the classifier. And once you've developed these, you're done. You have a classifier. And then you can apply that classifier in, in a wild context. So uh, the results of the challenge trials after we re-expose them to no normoxia or, or lower temperature, it takes days for them to recover, it turns out. So um, it takes three days. If you move a fish from 18 degrees to 10 degrees and we apply that classifier that we just developed, it takes three days for them to look like a 10 degree fish. This is really important when it comes to the field application because does the fish have to be in that stressor scenario at the time that you sampled it in order to see the stress or could it have been stressed two days ago? It turns out, yeah, it could have been stressed for a day or two, um, but maybe it went back to a normal condition um, and, um, and the stressor still shows up. It takes, a, oops, it takes two days uh, from hypoxia, and, um, and after three days, we actually put fish um, from salt water back to fresh water, and actually they did pretty well. <laughs> the different species did pretty well back in fresh water. We only did that for three days, um, but they, um, yeah, it, it took more than that for salt, for salt water. They, their signature didn't change when they went back to fresh water is what, I guess what I mean. Okay, so this is, this is basically all the different panels we now have, temperature, salinity, oxygen, viral disease, imminent mortality, smoltification, we're developing a starvation one. It actually seems to be working in gill tissue, which is amazing because it's not really a, 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 an energetic tissue, but, but we are able to find genes that can separate fish that have been food deprived and not. Uh, we also have panels to immune activation inflammation. Those are not classifier based. Those are, those are basically to be able to look at the relationship with pathogen infections. Uh, we have assays to 65 bacteria, viruses, and parasites, and we have 8 to 12 assays um, that we include in most fit chips, and then we have about 10 harmful algal bloom species assays as well, and this is the list of all the species we now work with. So the example I'm going to give of the application of these, and we published a lot of studies, but I, I get bored giving talks about stuff I've already published, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a, a project that we're doing right now, which is, I mean, really hot off the press. We have not published this yet, but it's, it really shows, in, in my view, the approach we're trying to get to. Um, and so these are, these are very early data. A lot of it I got a couple weeks ago. Um, but um, it's, a, it's an important project. It's on the west coast of Vancouver Island. It's called the Follow the Fish Project, and you'll understand what I mean about that in a minute. Uh, this is just a map of, of the west coast of Vancouver Island. These are the different sounds on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Here is uh, Vancouver Island here. That's British Columbia. That'd be Washington down there. So that's just in context of where we're talking. And this project was working on Chinook salmon. Chinook salmon, wild west coast Vancouver Chinook salmon are at-risk populations. Um, or CUs, uh, they have a very low genetic diversity because some of the highest productions of, aqua, of, of hatchery fish are on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So this just shows here west coast Vancouver Island releases and non-west coast Vancouver. So over a third of the releases for hatchery fish in British Columbia are west coast Vancouver Island. So these wild populations are just inundated with hatchery fish and, and that has lo had lowered their genetic diversity because there's a lot of strain. Uh, there's a high exposure to open salmon net farms, and most of the sounds to the north um, are, are, are areas where there's a lot of high-density farms. There's very low marine survival, generally less than 1%, sometimes only 0.1%. Um, that's marine survival, and that means that there's also very low numbers of spawning for those, for those wild populations. Um, so uh, we did, before we did this project, this was a, a kind of a unique project because we started off with a marine risk assessment where experts were brought into a room and looked at a whole bunch of different factors that have been hypothesized to contribute to variations in survival and salmon declines. And basically through this um, process, uh, different processes were ranked. We, we actually, uh, we looked at more than this, but these are the top ranking factors. And then there was money from Pacific Salmon, um, um, 
uh, initiative to, to really study and, and, and get into why, why salmon declines, um, why salmon are declining to the degree that they are. So we decided that, for, this is DFO, decided that West Coast Vancouver Island was going to be a key study site for this, for this kind of work. And, and then they solicited program, proposals to look at all of these different high ranking risk factors. We, we, we looked at the confidence of the ranking, the current risk, and what we think the future risk was. And the future risk was the most important one because we want to know what's going to happen um, moving forward. And so there were proposals submitted for all of those. I, I was part of that. Um, we, we devised the idea because, because there are so few wild salmon left, we didn't want to do a lot of sampling of, of wild salmon if we could. So we, we decided to focus on the hatchery fish, even though they do have a slightly higher survival than, than, than wild fish. They're so numerically abundant that it makes sense. So two hatcheries, Robertson Creek Hatchery and Nipnat Hatchery, both of them drain into Barkley Sound, which is the sound here, and I'm talk about, a lot about that one. And then those fish spend the summer in this sound, and then in the fall, they start moving up to the northern sounds. But they spend the entire first year off the west coast of Vancouver Island. You rarely see them anywhere north um, until, until about March. And so they hop up um, in the fall, and they, they start in Clayquot Sound, and then they keep moving up to these various sounds. I'm going to mostly talk about these two sounds in my talk today. So the difference between Barkley Sound and Clayquot Sound is Barkley Sound um, has no salmon farms. Um, and uh, we were able to sample them from spring through the first winter at sea. Clayquot Sound, we could sample them starting in about the fall, and we could sample them from fall to, winters, uh, to winter, um, and they reside there all, all that period. And there's a, a lot of salmon farm impacts there. These are the other names of the other sounds. I'm not actually going to show a lot of data from those. Um, those um, that, that's just kind of the same as Clayquot Sound in terms of salmon farms. This is just to show you uh, the data from one of the years. This is stock identification data to show you why we focus on Robertson Creek hatchery fish and, and a little bit Nitnat, which Nitnat and Sarita come from Nitnat hatchery. This is the, this is the number of fish out of a, out of a um, uh, captures across different sounds in the winter period um, that come from those, those hatchery stocks. So Robertson Creek dominates everywhere. You can get Robertson Creek everywhere. Uh, this is the wild populations of West Coast Vancouver Island. Um, and then there's quite a few Puget Sound fish. We kind of try to remove those. Some Columbia River fish and some, some fish from some other areas. So we applied the fit chips. I've already described that. Um, and so the fit chips were one of the technologies that I uh, put, proposed to use. We also proposed to look at environmental DNA across the same environments where we were doing the same kind of temporal sampling of environmental DNA overlapping with the fish collections, and I'll talk about why um, in a minute. Um, and then the idea was if you, if you could combine the information about the fish health using the, using the fit chips and the environmental DNA to look at the, uh, the health of the ecosystems, that, that you could actually address a whole bunch of, these, uh, of these, these factors that were being considered important in salmon declines, the prey, the competition, the predators, infection disease, climate change, and there were some data deficient ones that we were able to address. So we started in sampling in the freshwater environment, and it was important. So the fall of the fish was following the same stocks of fish throughout their freshwater rearing and the first year at sea. Um, and so Chinook are, are, were raised in those hatcheries. We sampled, we developed a sampling scheme where we ran fit chips on fish that were collected from different cohort tanks over the first, um, over the, the approximately five months in the hatcheries, we sampled every once a month or when it was getting close to smolting, we sampled every two weeks. We also sampled the water in the tanks, the eDNA in the tanks, and we sampled the source water coming into the tanks because they, they often change the source water from well water or, or surface um, water or deep water from a lake, et cetera. So we wanted to see um, what the pathogens were in those different environments. Um, and I'm going to jump right into some of the, the data. So if we look at the pathogens, there was a strong overlap in pathogen detections in the hatcheries, uh, in the fish and the eDNA. So if you look up at this plot up here, the eDNA detections are in blue. The fish detections from gill tissue are in red. And everything that's seen pretty much in the, in the gill with, um, you know, is also seen in the water in the tanks with the fish. But importantly, and this is just the load over here on the side, um, importantly, Almost all of them, not quite all of them, actually were coming in the incoming seawater. So we looked at all different sources of incoming seawater over those two hatcheries. And in fact, it was the incoming seawater that was inoculating those fish 
with um, or, or, or cause the, trend, um, the um, exposure of those fish to those pathogens. Um, there was one that was not found in the source water that probably came from the from food stock. These are complicated and I want you just to focus um, over on these plots over here. Uh, this is a panel, this is our smolt panel. So this is looking at the probability of a fish being a pre-smolt. So anything below this line, this is the actual data. These are actual probabilities of fish. Uh, ignore the purple, um, but just the little um, black ones are the probabilities. And this is over time. And these are all individual different cohorts of fish that are, that are run in the hatcheries. Over here, uh, it just takes the fish that, that, are, um, um, that are less than this line or, or greater than this line. This is the, the actual um, prevalence of pre-smolts in the tank. Okay, so all tanks start off with all the fish's pre-smolts. And over time, as they smultify, the prevalence of pre-smolts will go down. And so in this particular year, in 2024, in Robertson Creek Hatchery, at the time of release, and this is the last sample point before release, at the time of release, virtually all of the stocks were, um, um, were full smolts, which is great. However, in 2023, only about half of them were. So both hatcheries released only half full smolts and half pre-smolts in, in the first year that we did the study. And in the second year, they all got to full smolts. One of the reasons for that in the first year of the study is they started having huge mortality in the hatchery and they just let the fish go. Um, thermal stress was, was um, quite evident in the, in the Robertson Creek hatchery in 2023. Again, just look over here. You can see when the water was changed to natural, to natural um, water, river water, it was a lot warmer and the fish immediately um, had, a, had a thermal stress response. Fish were released into, uh, this was in 2023, they started dying very quickly in this and they were released into the river quickly because they were worried about the levels of mortality in the hatchery. So hypoxia was really interesting. So hypoxia in 2023 was increasing over, over time and especially increasing uh, at the same time that the thermal stress was occurring right before release. So that's not very good. They were releasing thermally stressed hypoxic fish at the time they were releasing. Uh, and viral disease development <clears throat> also was high um, at the time of release. So this went, this was uh, relatively uh, low in, uh, in early rearing and shot right up as soon as they hit that hot water with low oxygen. The reason for the uptick of, of, the, um, of the viral disease development was this specific salmon nidovirus, which was a virus that was discovered by Gideon Mordecai in my program. He worked, was working with Curtis Suttle at the time. And um, when we analyzed this data, uh, we found that, um, and, and not surprisingly, that it was highly associated. Again, this is model results. The viral disease panel was highly associated um, with the presence of, or the intensity of infection of the piscine, um, the nidovirus. Uh, innate immunity was quite activated. Um, in addition to our viral disease panel, other aspects of innate immunity were quite active, especially in Robertson Creek hatchery. Imminent mortality was associated with the presence of um, a high load of this, of this virus in Robertson Creek hatchery. Osmotic stress was also higher in fish that had um, this virus. And hypoxia levels were higher in the fish with this virus. It does affect the gill tissue. So it should um, actually affect respiration. That we didn't have as strong an effect um, in, um, in the nitnat hatchery, although the viral disease was, was still um, a factor. <clears throat> this, is a, this is just a way, and I know this looks complicated, and I just want to kind of get to this. What we're really trying to do is to understand cumulative factors, just like what I showed you in our challenge study, where we're trying to understand when you have multiple different stressors and, and, and infections, et cetera, going on. How do you get at the question of cumulative? How do you know when that, what, what's associated with what? And, and NMDS plots are one way to do it. They're very similar to PCA analysis. They're just a data reduction technique that looks at how similar different um, samples are to each other. And these are, these are data that come from the fit chips and the infectious agent data all at once. Um, and so what, what you're able to do is then overlay each of those panels on, onto this N NMDS and identify things that are coming together. So for example, inflammation, imminent mortality, and the, and, and the nidovirus here are all correlated. Um, and you see that thermal stress and hypoxia stress are quite correlated, and that's not surprising. You look at that end 
um, uh, data from the other one. Viral disease is also in the same direction as, as the NIDA virus. Um, and so this is just a way, I just wanted to introduce this as one way of looking at, at, a, at a cumulative framework. So down to the follow the fish um, with uh, the actual marine data, we then followed those same fish. We sampled them throughout the summer period in Barkley Sound, and we sampled them in the fall and winter period in both sounds. We actually sampled them across them, but I'm only gonna show these data because we have more samples there. This is what the, what the distribution of sampling looks like in the sounds. This is Barkley Sound, and this is Clayquot Sound. Um, and remember that it is Clayquot Sound that has the salmon farms. And um, so if we look at the summer data and you just kind of pull out what was interesting, what did we find in the early studies in the summer? Uh, it was that this is showing um, temperature profiles. So this is, this, is the, um, this is the thermal stress response looking at um, 18 degree equivalent thermal stress. And, and you can see there's no thermal stress really in June. There's no thermal stress at the equivalent to 18 degrees in July. There probably was 14, but I didn't plot that year. And in August, all of a sudden, thermal stress in almost all the fish, right? Those little dots are the prevalence of, of thermal stress, and you can see they're getting close to one. So it's close to all of the fish were thermally stressed that were sampled down here. And at the very same time that that thermal stress peaked, Tenacibacula maritime infection popped up. Didn't even see it in other times. And all of a sudden, we have high levels of Tenacibacula maritime um, in, those, in those fish. And in fact, this is the probability of thermal stress um, and sea surface temperature. So thermal stress is related to sea surface temperature. What this means is that despite the fact that juvenile Chinook salmon can go to low temperature um, and, and evade that 18 degree water, the fact of the matter is food is the most important thing to them. They're gonna go up into the surface waters to feed and, um, and they're probably gonna become per, per, um, perpetually thermally stressed if you have 18 degree water. Because even if they go back down every day, to go into cool water, it's not long enough for that thermal stress signal to disappear. Um, and so this just shows the, the peak in Tenacibacula maritimum in August, um, and, it, and it come down after that. So this is actually showing uh, a, a close-up of, of uh, Clayquot Sound, and this is showing kind of our sample distributions in Clayquot Sound, and all of these red dots are salmon farms. So you can see there's salmon farms throughout Clayquot, Sam, uh, Clayquot Sound, um, and, 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 and a lot of our sampling is, is around those farms. These are all Chinook salmon farms over here, down here, and then everything else is Atlantic salmon. Um, this is just showing cats per unit effort. So it says, where are we catching the fish? We, we, we had sampling all over the sound. Where are we actually seeing the peak abundance of fish? And what you see is a peak abundance of fish in this area here, and a peak abundance of fish in this one to the, to the south here those seem to be the hot spots of salmon based on catch data um oops if we look at um at hypoxia signals they were incredibly high um in the fall and and so now i'm moving from summer to fall um and in the fall period and just look at these two this is this is uh barkley sound um and Clay, this is Barkley, this is Clayquot Sound over two different years. And you can see in the fall, hypoxia stress was up to 100% of the fish in the fall, and it goes down over time. Well, it, it turns out that this is a map of where the hypoxia stress was and whether there were hot spots of hypoxia stress in the different sounds. If you look at Barkley Sound, so the lighter the color here, this is your color here, um, the model predicts like are, are there areas where you see higher proportions of fish with hypoxia than other areas. And you can see in the fall, there's much more hypoxia in the November, December, January period than there is in February and March. And we see the same kind of pattern in Clayquot Sound, but in Clayquot Sound, you actually see areas where there are peaks in hypoxia. So those, those same arms, and that's Herbert Channel, which is up here, and Bedwell, which is down here, are, are highly, show high, highly, um, high levels of hypoxia stress, even across the, all, all of the different, different seasons. And it turns out that does affect, that is um, consistent with the oceanographic data that, that have been collected over a number of years. Those are known low oxygen areas within those sounds. Hypoxia can be um, from um, other mechanisms besides environmental um, low oxygen. Harmful algal blooms, um, which are hugely problematic in, in British Columbia, can, um, can smother the gills in fish and cause hypoxic responses. You can have gill infections that are associated with hypoxia, anemia, intense exercise, and temperature extremes. So we can't always assume that when we see a hypoxia signal that there is low environmental oxygen. It could be other factors. So, 
So it's important once you figure out where you have a problem to then go and study those environments and try to understand the mechanism. So interestingly, when I was just looking at this data over in last week when I was making my talk, I was looking at these Herbert um, and Bedwell channels and going, what, what else is going on there? So we know that, that they, this is just looking at October data. We know that Herbert anyway is, is, is an area of high um, probability of capture of fish. We've already shown the high hypoxia signals. Ah, look at in October, that was also where we saw the strongest signals of Tenasa baculum maritimum in fish. And also the peaks of Piscine orthorheal virus. So the two pathogens we're most um, intimately um, working on right now are also associated with these really poor areas. So to me, this says, wow, I want to know much more about what's going on in those areas. What are the fish that are using those and what's their survival like? Um, and so I also wanted to say this for, for the next slide. So probability of capture decreases over time. So as I said, fish start moving northward in, in around October and they move between the sounds. And so I'm only looking at Clayquot sound, probability of capture. So you can see that it that gets darker and darker. You get fewer and fewer fish over time. Um, and, and so this is using our imminent mortality panel. So the, this panel predicts the probability that fish are on their way out. So it's, it, the, the stressor is, is an incredibly intense stressor um, signature. It's got a mixture of intense hypoxia stress, intense um, osmotic stress. Um, these are, and, and it's, it, you can see it night and day. It's, it's, it's a really, it's the most powerful transcriptional signature that you'll see is death which is interesting. And this signature actually increases after fish die for at least 24 hours. So you can sample a dead fish and they're all gonna show this signature, but you can sample a live fish that's kind of losing equilibrium and they'll already have this, this signature. And so oops, what we found was that it peaked in both sounds right around March. It's like, what's going on in March? Well, probably, and this is just a hypothesis. I only just saw this data. My hypothesis is, that these are the stragglers. These are the fish that weren't strong enough to continue migration. So every month you go, there's gonna be fewer and fewer fish in these sounds and whatever's left is probably the weaker of the fish. As I hypothesis. Anyway, I thought it was super interesting data. Um, I didn't wanna have all this. Okay, so, um, so now I, I, I kinda of wanna go on to cumulative and, and look at the ecosystem. And I have very few slides on that. Um, so environmental DNA, we took the same kind of sampling of, for environmental DNA across all these sounds. If we look at the Chinook distribution across the sounds, same kind of pictorial um, um, pictures. Uh, this is Barkley sound, so you can see that there are some hot spots for Chinook, juvenile Chinook salmon across the sounds. Some of these would actually also um, overlap with adult returns. Chinook is huge all over Clayquot Sound. I mean, it's just, it's, it's absolutely everywhere. Um, and, and this is coming from the eDNA data. I already showed you this data from the catch data. So the catch data doesn't t tells you a slightly different story. However, the hot spots here um, are still being shown by the eDNA. So the eDNA shows that there's more Chinook salmon, especially in Herbert Channel, than other parts, um, just the same as the catch data. Uh, we have the same kind of pl plots for all the different salmon species, and we detected all of these different salmon from eDNA. Uh, if we look at Tanasa baculum mar maritime in, from an eDNA perspective, we see the same kind of pattern um, in Claycott Sound, where it's, it's, it's in Herbert Channel um, in a big way. This is a different year, so this isn't even the same year as the fish data. Um, and, and this is kind of showing a hot spot of um, basically a, an outbreak pattern of pathogens. There's high density fa salmon farms all throughout here. Um, probably contributing to those patterns. This was interested in, in Quatsino sound. We only saw this outbreak at the, at the um, entry point of the sound. That's the only place that there are salmon farms in that, in that sound. There's nothing in, in here, um, et cetera. So we have the occurrence network. So this is, this is an important way of looking at environmental DNA. So this is a co-occurrence networks from high throughput um, qPCR. So basically we had assays for um, all the different salmon species, we had assays to different pathogens, we had assays to marine fish, and we're looking at this in a salmon-centric way, what are, what are the pathogens and marine fish that are associated with each other in the eDNA data? 
And, and if we're just being Chinook centric, which I tend to be, uh, we find that Chinook are co-localized with the piscine prey. They like, they like areas where there's surf smelt, anchovy and herring, and they are attracted again, we see an attraction to salmon farm. This is a totally different area of the coast. However, we see an attraction to salmon farm of multiple species of salmon, not just Chinook with this data set. And the only two species that are not co-occurring with salmon farms are sockeye and chum. So, um, uh, I, and I didn't even have time to label this one, so I'm going to tell you what this co-occurrence network says. This is from metabarcoding data. Um, wild salmon are avoiding areas of harmful algal blooms. So this has been an interesting question I've had for ages. To, do, do they actually recognize that they're in danger in areas where there are harm, harmful algal blooms? And it looks like they might. These are the different harmful algal bloom species that were detected, and you rarely saw wild salmon in the areas where we detected them. Chinook salmon are attracted to areas with high pristine prey. This was through metabarcoding. We already showed that with qPCR data, same kind of data. Um, North Pacific hake, which is a salmon predator, was co-localized with Chinook. It actually uh, liked the same areas that Chinook are, but it is a predator of, of Chinook salmon. Um, and Chinook avoid, uh, avoid areas with high abundance of jellyfish. We also found that um, in the Gulf of Alaska, so that's very similar to what we saw there. Nudibranchs, white bait smelt, ribbon worms, nude, um, oh, I said nudibranchs twice, and kelp beds. We didn't find Chinook in kelp beds, and there's some pretty extensive kelp beds there, and Chinook were avoiding the kelp beds. So in summary, um, you know, high throughput molecular and genomic technologies can reveal a lot about wild salmon in a wild context. You know, we can look at direct impacts of environmental stress on salmon. We can look at holistic indices of, of infection and health. Um, we can look at spatial and temporal hotspots, and I didn't even show you um, all of that from the pathogen standpoint, um, and where fish are most and least infected or stressed, and where they're likely to die with the imminent mortality panel. Uh, we can look at species networks, like I just showed you for eDNA. The important thing to note here is that it's the weight of evidence approach that we're looking for. Like if we tackle these questions with all different angles and different technologies, it's when we keep seeing the same patterns over and over again, despite using a different technology, that's when you kind of go, I'm on to something. This is, this is important. This is something we need to be focused on. And my goal is to be able to identify where, um, what habitats do we need to remediate in a, in a coastal marine environment um, and to overlay these, these distributions of, of poor health and poor ecosystem health and poor salmon health with information about um, human caused um, disturbances. So, you know, salmon farms, there's, there's mining, there's forestry, there's road building, there's all kinds of different things that come into um, these habitats. And do we see a higher level uh, or a poor condition of fish and a poor condition of their ecosystem in areas that are affected by human activity? Um, and then also um, we need to do more stock recruitment modeling with the fit ships like we did with pathogens, which Sean's going to be doing, <laughs> and modeling cumulative factors. And that's the end of my talk. We started, well, all right, we started a bit late. Uh, and we are going a bit late, so if people need to leave, you're welcome to. But I will turn this on to field a few questions. Christy's also, are you able to stay for a few yeah, minutes yeah, afterward yeah. To, for the Wind Down Wednesday? So there's that. Any questions? I won't throw this. <laughs> Hi. Um, awesome talk. Um, I was curious about thinking about developing kind of similar fit ship technologies for other species of interest. Um, if you were thinking about doing that kind of same biomarker panel for a different species, is that the kind that is that experimental design of that challenge experiment which you would uh, recommend to kind of develop uh, biomarkers. I, I, I do because I, I could tell you it's so important to be able to, to develop, you know, most people when they would tackle something like this, they'd go and do a thermal stress challenge and then they'd go and do a, a low oxygen challenge and they develop biomarker panels, but they wouldn't know how well, they, how well they would work when there's other things going on in the background. And when we're trying to do something in a wild organism, there's always other stuff going on in the background. You never have a pure environment. 
Um, and so, yeah, it, but, the, but the, the things that you have to think about is, are you focused on, on acute stress responses or chronic stress responses? It depends a little bit on your organism too. You need to know a little bit of background. We already know that 18 degrees, a salmon can take 18 degrees for, you know, 18 degrees alone for, depends on the life history stage and the stock, but, you know, up to a couple of weeks, they can survive that if that was the only thing that they were experiencing. And most of them that were only in thermal stress did survive six days. Um, so you need to know something about the life history of your animal and, and, and what the stressor points would be. We had the hardest time with hypoxia um, because what we found is unless we really restricted the oxygen levels, the fish just sat on the bottom and just behaviorally responded. They, they changed their respiration rate. They sat on the bottom. They didn't do very much, but they didn't change transcriptionally at all. And so it was only because one of our hypoxia uh, tanks accidentally got too low and the fish started dying. And we used those fish to then do an RNA-seq study to discover more hypoxia genes. And, and then we did more studies to figure out what level wouldn't kill the fish immediately, but would give us the, the response. So there's a lot that you have to kind of know as much as you can. What we did find, um, well, tissue matters. So you have to figure out if you're gonna do it in other species, what kind of tissue you want. You want something that is responding to the external environment. So, you know, gill is an obvious one. Um, some people might use blood, but it's way harder to get. Um, and, and we didn't want to use skin, but skin's another one that, that you could use, but it's not really a known stress response kind of tissue. Um, and, um, and then, yeah, it takes, it takes experimental studies. So we started when we were developing the panels, looking at already, already, um, already published paper. So for viral disease development, we were able to use the literature to find um, the best panels and, and they, they turned um, and we, we basically um, identified many, many different um, viral stress or uh, viral challenge studies across many different species and identified the ones, the genes that were consistently turned on with different viral um, challenge studies. Um, but for other things like hypoxia, most of the studies weren't done in gill tissue and we did not find that we could just use some, some um, a hypoxia challenge study that looked at a liver tissue or looked at something else, uh, that didn't translate very well. So we had to do RNA-seq to find the, the right genes. Does this thing actually throw? Yes, okay. <laughs> Does anyone catch? <laughs> <laughs> All right, strong arm. <laughs> uh, amazing presentation. Um, so kind of, You've, you know, obviously worked in the field for many, many years. Um, so I guess, how optimistic are you about the for fisheries and climate change, as things continue to change? Um, and how do you think kind of the fish are going to respond to do a lot of future? Yeah, I guess, like, what is your thoughts on this? Yeah, so right now, one of the big areas in, in fishery science is identifying what populations are going to be resilient um, and doing so um, you know on a on a genetic basis but also looking at phenotypic var uh, variances and I, I was involved in a project on on kokanee that was looking for if you know we're getting such hot water in different in different freshwater systems is there any kokanee population that's really resilient to that i mean if, if they all most kokanee is um, is uh, stocked um, and so what are the what are the most resilient thermally, you know, um, resilient stocks that they could that they could use? I mean, it's not I, I, I'm not so optimistic to think it's ever going to get back to what it was. Um, and we're going to have to, to, to live with that. Uh, there's going to be a change. There are going to be species that do really well. Pink salmon has taken over the world, <laughs> you know, so, you know, we may not be able to get, uh, you know, to have huge fisheries on some of the species that we prize the most unless we do something drastically. I'm not a super fan of huge numbers of hatcheries. Uh, I really worry about the, the genetic effects of, of hatcheries. There's plenty of um, studies that have shown that, that in the long run that they are not a good thing. Um, obviously having some captive broodstock, what they do in Norway, and I'm not saying Norway does a lot of great stuff, but I do some work in Norway. And they, they, have, um, they, they collect sperm every year from their wild stocks. And they don't actually do hatcheries, but they've got sperm banks for decades that they can go back in case they need it um, and they only use it when they're when things are really dire um, 
So I think you know adaptability is is a, is a huge area, and it's it's going to be really important. And then obviously uh, looking at future climate models, but we're going to have to expect less, you know, in terms of those fisheries. We just you know we can't keep exploiting um, stocks until there's nothing left, and and it's it's hard to see you know our our Pacific salmon get as low as they have, and we're still better than a lot of places in the world. But given you know the stock collapses of Atlantic cod, I don't know if you know about that. And in in Canada, I mean they almost got down to nothing. And you know I'm working for the Department of Fisheries. Like we got to be doing something here, and it's going down, down, down. But there's so much pressure in a in a federal agency to promote fisheries. You know that is that is you know it's it's, it's sustainable fisheries, but it, their job is to promote fisheries for 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 um, sustainability and for economic prosperity. So it's it's going to be hard. Um, your generation's going to have to take it on. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry I haven't been able to turn it all around in my in in my time, but I'm hoping that that with the technologies that we've got, maybe we we can make more headway. Um, but yeah, it's not great. Um, so you mentioned that. Uh, oh, that's not going. You mentioned that uh, salmon shows some behavioral avoidance hypothesis. Well, so wondering if hybrid ferment work or botanical and observation that some folks high temperature. So we 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 did a study on uh, juvenile sockeye with the fit chips um, a few years back. That one is is, is published. Um, it was in a, a system cultus lake that gets very high surface temperatures and very low oxygen. So the surface temperature gets very high in the summer. The oxygen tends to go down by midsummer and then through the fall. And then eventually the surface temperatures um, um, go down, but the hypoxia stays at, at the bottom. So juvenile salmon generally are, are use the bottom of the lake systems as a sockeye salmon uh, during the day because they avoid predation. Um, and then they come up to the surface to feed at night. And we were only able to catch them in the system because this is an endangered population of, of sockeye salmon. The question was how important are the environmental stressors in that system um, to, to the salmon? So the question was, are they actually feeling those stressors? And, and so we were only able to collect the salmon when they were in the middle of the water column, when they were kind of going up and down. That's the only way we could really catch them effectively. And, um, and lo and behold, in the months where we saw high water temperatures at the surface, they were um, at least 75% of the fish showed thermal, uh, strong thermal stress, and, um, but they also showed hypoxia. So they were experiencing those in different environments, but, but they were experiencing the both together in the months that they were both there. Um, so in, in my experience with uh, tagging studies, tagging and tracking studies where we have um, oxygen sensors or temperature sensors, um, fish will choose low oxygen over high temperature um, unless there's a reason to be in high temperature. And most of that work is done in adult fish where they're not feeding anymore. So juvenile fish are a different thing because they want food more than anything. Adult fish just want to get to the spawning grounds. And so adult fish um, coming, for example, through the Fraser River that have, that have um, tags in them, um, that, that actually monitor those conditions and their exposure, you only get to get them once you get the tags back. So it's only surviving fish that you get to look at. But they basically will um, avoid high, hot, hot water more if they're heavily infected than if they're not, because a lot of pathogens um, replicate rapidly. So when they're starting to feel sick from pathogens, they'll start diving deep into the lakes and not using the surface waters to the same degree. Sometimes they veer off their path just to get to cold water or they'll go off to a glacially fed stream. Um, but, um, but they will withstand the low um, oxygen conditions at the bottom of lakes just to get rid of the high, just to get out of that high temperature. So I think they are actually pretty resilient to low oxygen. However, you can see from my slides, there's a lot of hypoxia stress out there. Um, and we do know from our challenge study that you, you put hypoxia stress with the high oxygen and, and survival is gonna be considerably lower. can come to the wind down Wednesday. Hi, uh, Christy, great talk. One, I may be misinterpreting something, but in your network diagram that you had, and it showed that in the co-occurrence network that 
pathogens co-occurring. I, I, they, that, they did, and I just didn't want to go into it because that was really complicated. Okay. Um, there are pathogens, that, and, and there's a lot. There's a lot to dissect out of that. Um, but there are pathogens that specifically co-occurred with specific species of salmon, and they generally relate to the ones that we tend to see in those species. There were some that that co-occurred with only with Atlantic salmon, um, and that fits the patterns also that we know of infection on farms. But you're absolutely right. There were ones that were co-occurring with each other, and those are the ones we really should be paying a lot of attention to in the water column. And, and so I don't know how that network built exactly, but so so the co-occurrence, when you do see a co-occurrence event, that actually means the multiple pathogens are in the same fish, or does it? No, those are, that's eDNA. That's all oh, environmental okay, DNA. Okay. So that means that you are more likely to see those pathogens together gotcha. in an environment than you are when they're, when they're separate. Gotcha. Okay, so. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Christy. And uh, Christy's gonna come down, the, down to the wind, wind Down Wednesday if anyone wants to hang out, ask any remaining questions.